Welcome to the last module of the Geo MOOC. By now, you will know everything on how rocks are formed, how the Earth works, and also something about hydrocarbons. The time has now come to tackle what is possibly the most important commodity of all, water. Everybody needs water, and societies need it too. The water we use comes in large portion from river, followed by groundwater, and in smaller amounts from marine water. We use water for a variety of purposes, mainly industry and irrigation, and only a small part for public use, like drinking and taking showers. Water resources are in many countries under great pressure because of a combination of factors. A profound knowledge of the hydrologic system is a prerequisite for responsible use of water. In the cartoon, already known to you, you see the water cycle. Waters evaporate from the sea, rise, and depending on circumstances, fall back as precipitations. We have looked in previous models to the water flowing on the surface of the Earth. It is now time to start looking to what happens to the water infiltrating the outer part of the Earth. In the hydrogeology cycle, the first component is recharge areas. That is, the places where water enters into the ground. The most important of all areas of recharge are those with large precipitations. We have seen in previous models that mountains, especially on their windward side, are great recharge areas. In specific conditions, also water bodies such as rivers and lakes can also form recharge areas. We will see at a later stage how this is possible. The water infiltrating the underground in the recharge areas will enter high permeability layers partly or fully saturating them with water. These layers are called aquifers and they contrast with low permeability layers called aquitards. Water in the underground can follow two paths and being stored in unconfined or confined aquifers. If the uppermost part of the underground is composed of permeable layers, then the waters will accumulate in these rocks, forming an unconfined aquifer. An unconfined aquifer is therefore an open system. Being close to the surface, unconfined aquifers are the first one to be used by all communities and are increasingly under pressure. If in the recharge area, permeable layers are found which dip steeper than the topography, and therefore continue deep in the subsurface, the waters will flow along these layers forming confined aquifers. Differently from what observed for unconfined aquifers, they are bounded by two low permeability formations and are fully saturated with water. Confined aquifers are deeper and more difficult to access, but have clearly some major advantages, like the fact that they are protected from negative effects from the surface and that they typically have clean waters. To keep water flowing, the hydrological system obviously needs also discharge areas, that is, domains where the water leaves the aquifer and goes back to the surface. Rivers and lakes are common discharge areas. Others are springs, like the ones you see in the figure. We mentioned that water systems are under pressure in a variety of situations. Here you see some examples. I don't think that we need much explanation to this. An interesting example is from rural communities in Niger, where I worked many years ago. Precipitations, precipitation in the air are very low, below 200 millimeters per year, and erratic. Villagers generally take water from small ephemeral lakes and dig few meter deep wells where water quantity is variable and quality generally poor. In the area, like in many places in North Africa, there are confined aquifers, but they are, all, are a few hundreds of meters deep and can only be reached and produced with advanced technological material. Communities have then started digging wells several tens of meters deep, which reach partly confined aquifers hosted in small lenses of sand, water of better quality. The challenge is then to predict the extension and depth of these bodies so that they can be reached by traditional wells. In a very different setting, agriculture is surely one of the most important challenges to water resources, as it, agriculture needs a lot of water. An apparent example is provided by the high plains unconfined aquifer 
one of the largest aquifers on Earth. The result of very intensive agricultural activities and proportionate use of water has resulted in a major depletion of the groundwater reserves. Clearly, we are not using water in a sustainable manner. In addition, agriculture in many places still uses large amounts of chemicals which flow back into the unconfined aquifer, polluting the water. Careful management is absolutely needed in these conditions. Already from these first few slides, you see hydro that hydrogeology has a lot to do with flow and fluxes. A quantitative knowledge of such fluxes is a necessity for geologists and hydrogeologists. And I want to give you here a very few basic ideas. Fluxes of water into, through, and out of the aquifer are combined into the geologi hydrogeological balance, which is essentially conservation of mass applies to water. What comes in has to go out. This is the general equation of the hydrologic balance. If the various components, or at least their total contribution, remains constant, then the volume of the water in the system will not change, and the water table will not change its position. You can look in detail at the scripts for these more information. Let us now imagine that we drill a well and start pumping. The system will react and reach a new steady state which calls for an increase of flow into the drill volume. If this is not sufficient, there will be a decrease in water volume and of the water table. Clearly, a non-sustainable situation, unfortunately one which occurs more often than what would like, is being generated. From the small flow exercise above, it is clear that the correct definition of the geometry and the physical properties of the aquifer is key to successful management of water resources. It's up to the geologist to use available data, interpolate between wells to create a viable hydrogeological model for the subsurface. This might be relatively easy for superficial, unconfined aquifers, but becomes more challenging for confined aquifers, which might be hundreds of meters deep, or even much more for geothermal fields, often located at depths of several hundreds of meters or even few kilometers. Great challenges ahead.